Good afternoon, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Perfect. Our next session is on communicating about ethics. Our session today is about providing information about how scientists can communicate effectively their values and ethical considerations regarding research with animals. Our speaker for this presentation is Dr. Adam Shriver. He's the Director of Wellness and Nutrition at the Harkin Institute for Public Policy. Much of Adam's research has focused on the intersection of ethics and cognitive science, and he's written multiple articles about human well-being and animal welfare. Adam has written about the relationship between pain and pleasure, the legal and ethical questions that arise from the search for a neural signature for pain in humans, and the capacity for suffering across different species. You have his bio, so I'm going to stop there and I'm going to turn the session over to Adam. All right. Thanks, Candace, and great to see you again. Um, I guess I thought I would start out with a poll um, if we are ready to do that. I don't know how much queuing up we need, but um, just kind of curious to see where different people are coming from when we ask about ethics and animals. Okay, so is the poll visible? Oh, okay. I couldn't see it on my monitor. Looks like we're slowing down a little. There were a lot of words in this poll, so. Yeah. Excellent, yep. Yeah. Okay, so we're good. Um, all right, that is interesting. So I, the thing I was, the option I was terrified with, or the result I was terrified with was is everyone said they had some view that was not captured by any of the options. So, uh, so I'm glad to see that um, there were, uh, I was roughly, you know, approximating some people's views. So the, the first view was um, basically a consequentialist position, which is that if the benefits outweigh the harms, then uh, actions that involve animals might be uh, uh, permissible, ethically permissible. And the second one is that there's some things that are right or wrong, and that seemed to, uh, or in, uh, independently of the consequences, and that seemed to take the, take the lead. So um, great, thank you, that is very interesting. All right, so uh, can we remove the poll from the screen? So in the spirit of, uh, oh, it's, it's the, okay, cool. In the spirit of uh, drawing uh, upon uh, previous sessions, I wanted to uh, give my eight second pitch of, uh, of what I think the presentation is. Uh, which is basically that it's important to recognize the difficulty of ethical questions about animal research and to communicate that we all recognize that difficulty. So that's gonna be the point I'm gonna try to drive home today. Um, and now that I have uh, you know, triumphantly achieved this uh, PR victory of getting, uh, getting, getting it into eight seconds, I am now going to proceed with a bunch of slides that are very text heavy and dense because <laughs> I, ha I have a limitation of how much PR savvy I can ever do it at one time. Um, but I, I will say first uh, that uh, just a little bit about where I work. So I'm uh, at the Harkin Institute uh, for Public Policy and Citizen Engagement. Um, it was an institute at Drake University that was founded when uh, US Senator Tom Harkin retired. He had a long career in public service. Um, and it focuses on different themes uh, that were related to his work. Uh, so labor employment, people with disabilities, retirement security, and wellness and nutrition are the, the big themes. 
Uh, but everything I'm going to say here is just my own views, uh, doesn't represent the views of the Harkin Institute. Um, I will also say a little bit about my own background. Um, Candace uh, nicely uh, mentioned a few things, um, so I'll just be quick. But um, I got my PhD in an interdisciplinary program at Washington University in St. Louis called um, uh, Philosophy, Neuroscience, Psychology, which was a philosophy program where you were also required to take 24 credit hours of graduate level courses in these other fields. Uh, and then I did postdocs at the Brain and Mind Institute at Western uh, University in London, uh, Canada, um, the University of Pennsylvania Center for Medical Ethics, the UBC uh, Animal Welfare Program, and the Oxford Uhiro Center for Applied Ethics. Um, so, so I've had a lot of uh, interdisciplinary experiences, but um, from you know, being in the, the audience and, and taking in what's been talked about so far, I really want to lean quite heavily on um, the philosophy side of things and, and why I think philosophy um, can be useful for this discussion and specifically the philosophical underpinnings of ethics. So uh, I guess one question you might ask right at the beginning is, you know, what do you mean by philosophy? What, what, uh, what exactly part of it uh, is, is important. Um, and there's different definitions. Philosophy, of course, means uh, the love of wisdom. And I'm not so concerned with what the exact subject matter of philosophy is, as much as I want to just point out that there's this methodological feature that is often associated with philosophy, which is that it's grappling with really difficult questions where there's no clear-cut method for determining an answer. Right. So um, if we want to know what the temperature is in this room, uh, there's a fact of the matter what the temperature is. And we all kind of have a rough sense of what we would do to, to figure it out. Um, there are more complicated questions like which parts of the brain are involved in visual perception. Um, and, you know, maybe a lot more goes into that. But there's still something that, you know, we have a rough idea of what method we could use to answer that question. Uh, but philosophy is really generally grappling with questions where there's no agreed upon straightforward way to, to sort of get the answer where everyone's gonna just be like, oh, okay, that's, that's the right way to approach it. Um, and uh, that's part of why some people really love philosophy. Um, and it's also part of why a lot of people really dislike philosophy is because there's not this, uh, you know, there's not this straight path uh, towards uh, getting the answer. And, um, and it's not, and the people who dislike it, uh, I'm not, it's not, uh, I think it's really kind of almost a personality thing where, you know, you could be someone who's quite brilliant in many ways, but who just doesn't sort of enjoy that type of question. Um, so uh, I don't mean it as a, as a particular type of criticism, um, but I will say uh, in, in philosophy's defense to the people who really dislike it is um, we historically have had this uh, phenomenon where once philosophers get, you know, actually come across a good method for answering a question, then it ceases to be a philosophy. So uh, like biology, for example, was uh, came from Aristotle and psychology came out of philosophy as well. So, so uh, you know, the successes kind of go, <laughs> go into another field uh, as, soon as, as soon as we actually uh, reach agreement. But the point I wanna emphasize is just, uh, it's dealing with these really difficult questions. Okay, so why? Uh, is this relevant for today's workshop or today and yesterday's workshop about communicating about research on animals? Well, I will argue that it's relevant because you can't fully avoid philosophy if you're talking about values. There's no clear cut path towards telling people what, uh, what values they should have. So it's a philosophical question in the way that I just uh, framed what philosophical questions are. And uh, you can't avoid talking about values if you're taking a position on whether and to what extent we should be engaging in a particular form of research. Um, so it could be animal research, it could be any kind of research, but um, by engaging, by choosing to fund, engage, uh, and participate in certain practices we're expressing a set of values, right? That's, that's a, a reflection of what we deem to be important as a society. Um, so just to kind of summarize that, the practice of science is not entirely value-free. 
right? There's, there's values built into um, what we choose to study, how we choose to regulate what we study, um, you know, who gets funding, those types of things. Um, and I would add that if you think that you're engaging in a value-free practice of science, uh, what you are actually doing is engaging in a science where the values are unexamined. Um, and if there's one thing I can tell you that philosophers don't like, it's unexamined things. We really, that just really bugs us. Uh, and I gotta say, I think in this case, I am biased, but I think we're right about this one. I think, I think it's, it's not a good thing to have um, unexamined values when it, comes to, when it comes to science. So it's important to be reflective about these questions. I also just wanna point out, just because of the terminology is sort of close enough, that <clears throat> I am not taking the uh, position that um, science can't be objective. So this is a sort of different kind of claim than, uh, you know, so I'm just saying that as we choose to practice certain things or do certain types of uh, science, we are taking a position, but that's a different type of claim from sort of more like postmodern y view that, you know, anything that has a viewpoint on the world uh, has to be subjective. Um, that's an interesting debate, but that's not what I'm talking about. So I just want to kind of flag that I, I mean something different when I say it's not value free. Um, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so another thing I wanted to point out is that, um, you know, it's kind of come up a few times in this workshop, this idea of emotions and how emotions influence uh, some of these conversations. Um, and I think it's important to point out that values and emotions are not the same thing, right? They're not, it's not uh, saying that you value something isn't the same thing as have, saying that you have an emotional reaction to that thing. Um, and I would say that we could strive to have, make decisions about the practice of science that's more or less free from emotion, right? I, I said you can't have a value-free science, but I think you could have a emotion-free science in some sense where uh, it's not, you know, motivated by being in an emotional state. Um, and then I'll sort of refer back to this idea <clears throat> in a little bit and why I think it's important. Okay. Um, and so related to that, um, I think it's important to acknowledge that sometimes in a disagreement, uh, if two different sides, uh, it, th that disagreement might be resolved if both sides of the disagreement agree on a relevant set of facts. Um, so there's sometimes we have a disagreement, uh, but it's just because we're getting different information. And if you uh, get, you know, you, everyone agrees on the facts, then you say, oh yeah, okay, now, now we uh, would reach the same conclusion. Now, of course, this seemed much more true 20 years ago, I have to say, where <laughs> nowadays it seems like even basic facts um, sort of uh, are, up for grabs in a lot of public conversations in, in strange ways. Uh, well, not that they're actually up for grabs, but just that um, people don't agree on uh, basic sets of basic facts. But in any event, there are some types of disagreements like that, um, but there are other types of disagreements about uh, values. Um, and in those cases, it's not just a matter of explaining uh, or educating the other person. You know, it's a genuine disagreement. People have different values, uh, and it's not just a case where uh, if you educate that other person, they are then going to agree with you. Um, and importantly, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that the other person's judgment is clouded by emotion, right? They might just have a different set of values, um, and it's important for us to be aware of that and acknowledge it. Okay, so what are some examples of this that I think are important? So I, you know, I, think, I think we need to be uh, aware of the different sets of values that people have and to you know, be willing to engage with those different values. Um, so what are some examples where this can be important? Um, well, I'll start with a quote from uh, John Rawls, who's a philosopher at Harvard, uh, who says, moral theory is the study of substantive moral conceptions, that is the study of how basic notions of the right, the good and moral worth may be arranged to form different moral structures. Okay, so that's a little, you know, heady, um, but the basic idea is that there are different uh, notions of moral concepts and what uh, ethics is, is the study of these different concepts and how they relate to one another. 
Um, and so some of these terms he's using in a, in, a, in a specific way. So I'll point those out. So this notion of right um, is, you know, if you're asking whether a question is right or wrong, um, whether it's something that's morally permissible, whether it's morally obligatory, where it's, whether it's morally um, forbidden, um, that's a type of question about individual actions, whether they're right or wrong. Um, the good, on the other hand, is talking about how we evaluate states of the world. And so you can ask um, what types of things are good or bad. Um, and then uh, moral worth in this case is about um, what we might call virtues and vices. So different character traits that people might have. Um, and so you can ask questions about all these different types of concepts. Uh, and you can also ask how they relate to each other. How, how do these different notions, how does the answer to one question inform or not inform uh, an answer to another question? Okay, so the most kind of um, you know, straightforward uh, example of how they relate to each other is uh, a theory called consequentialism in ethics. Um, and uh, you know, it's sort of a you know, big sounding word, but the basic idea is just, you know, if you're evaluating what's right or wrong, um, all you need to know really is what consequences result from that action. And so if the consequences that result from it are good or you know, good enough, um, then you could say that the action is right. Um, and if the consequences that result from it are bad, um, then, uh, you could, then you would say that um, you know, the action is wrong. And as we saw in the poll, a lot of people have a view similar to this when it comes to thinking about animal research, right? That the, uh, if the benefits that come out of it outweigh any potential harms, um, then, um, then we could say that that practice is justified. Um, so utilitarianism is kind of a more familiar, familiar word than consequentialism, but utilitarianism is just basically a version of consequentialism where um, you say all that matters is the consequences and uh, what the consequences are are just positive and negative mental states. So the best actions are those that promote happiness and uh, prevent uh, unhappiness or prevent suffering. Okay, so one thing to note is that human bioethics, as I'm sure everyone in here knows, uh, is very unapologetically non-consequentialist, right? There are rules that the IRBs uh, follow that will say that certain types of research is forbidden no matter what potential scientific benefit could come out of it, right? If you don't get informed consent, you can't do certain types of research. If you don't um, have fair subject selection, you can't do certain types of research, even if that research is going to result in some really great benefits to society or you think it's likely to. Um, so human uh, bioethics is very non-consequentialist. Um, I also wanted to highlight a kind of an, a, an extreme version of non-consequentialism just to drive home um, why I think that um, these differences in values um, are getting at something really fundamental and are worth, worth taking seriously. So, um, so Dochayevsky um, in The Brothers Karamazov has this passage that's kind of famously known as the Grand Inquisitor passage where one of the characters is talking to um, the great inquisitor, and he presents the character with this dilemma. Um, so it says, imagine that you're creating a fabric of human destiny with the object of making men happy in the end, giving them peace and rest at last, but that it was essential and inevitable to torture to death only one tiny creature. Would you consent to be the architect of those conditions? So the idea is, you know, what if you could have this utopian society at the cost of one, in this case, it was a baby, you know, one baby uh, having this miserable, you know, sort of tortured existence, would you be willing to make that trade-off? So the consequentialist should say, yes, of course, you know, you should do that because the overall consequences outweigh the negative consequences. But a lot of people are very uncomfortable with that conclusion, right? It's a little disquieting. There's something about it that, um, that can bother us to say, um, that it's okay to do that to one individual for the sake of um, uh, even you know, this incredible amount of positive consequences. And so I think you can also ask this question, and there, there are also um, 
sort of longer treatments of this. So Ursula Le Guin has a nice book that kind of talks about this theme as well. Uh, but I think it's important to also, you know, ask this question about um, what about someone who looks at an individual lab animal and has that same thought, you know, that it doesn't matter what consequences would result from it. Um, it's just wrong. Um, I don't share that view. You know, I, I think that, um, you know, if you have this question of what, you know, what if uh, you had to cause a little bit of distress to 10 mice, or so let's say dogs, 10, uh, a little bit of distress to 10 dogs, but it prevented thousands of dogs in the future from having distress. To me, it seems like, okay, yeah, that probably um, is the right thing to do. You should do that, you should do that research. But I also think there's something, you know, I think it, we have to acknowledge that there's something powerful and meaningful about taking that individual life really seriously, about, you know, saying, looking at that individual creature, whether it's a dog or whether it's a baby in this case, and saying, like, I empathize with that feeling. I take it seriously. It's meaningful. Um, and so I understand where people who have that position are coming from. And I think it's a it's an important position to, to recognize and to value, even if it's ultimately one that I don't agree with. Um, so that's kind of, yeah, what I'm, what I'm getting at when I say that uh, I, we need to recognize that these value questions are not just straightforward. It's not just uh, as simple as knowing the right facts or avoiding emotions, but you can sort of see how people might have different intuitions on some of these cases. Um, I'll mention a few other things uh, quickly. So um, the other uh, type of moral concept I mentioned uh, is moral worth. Um, so that has to do with things like character, having a good character or not having a bad character. Um, and, uh, you know, it turns out that as I'm sure many people in here know, that um, the character traits of people who take care of animals is something that matters quite a bit to the public, right? If, um, I'm thinking of a lot of uh, um, agricultural research, but, uh, or, or sorry, studying public views about agriculture. And, uh, you know, people care a lot about whether the farmer cares about their animal um, and, uh, and uh, is just sort of a, a good person. Um, but that actually, you know, might conflict with different views that say, well, the only thing that matters is really the welfare of the animal, right? The animal, the, the animal doesn't care if this person is well-intentioned or not. The animal just cares if, you know, what their, what their experience is. Um, but that's not really how a lot of people think about it. So again, there's this kind of conflict in different intuitions where some people might say character should be totally irrelevant and, and other people take it um, really seriously as something that's important. And so all of these different concepts, the right, the good, character, uh, there are a lot of different ways in which they um, interact with each other on different views. Um, and I think a lot of people implicitly or explicitly have different values when it comes to those things. And they can be having a discussion about ethics and really be talking past each other because they don't share uh, the same way of thinking about these different types of values. Um, so I'll mention an, a couple other um, questions about value that I think are important to, to be aware of when we're um, thinking about animal research. Um, one is cross-species comparisons. So you can ask, um, how do you compare the lives of humans with the lives of other species in moral decisions? Um, you know, some people would say you just can't compare them at all. Uh, other people say everything, you know, every being should be equal, right? So got that bell curve uh, idea that we referenced the other day. Um, and similarly, you could ask, uh, how do you compare the experiences of humans with the experiences of other species and moral decisions? So not just a, li a life as a whole, but, you know, an individual experience of different creatures. Um, and even if you think uh, the comparison between humans and other species isn't interesting on your view, you, you know, it comes up in animal ethics or animal research ethics, you know, comparisons between other species, right? This whole idea of replacing um, more cognitively sophisticated animals with less cognitively sophisticated animals um, comes down to certain questions about, you know, how do you compare um, moral, moral value on these different species? So I'll just mention um, this project 
from uh, a group called Rethink Priorities that they called the Moral Weight Project. Um, and I consulted a little bit on this um, where they tried a number of different methodologies to try to get at this question of how do you evaluate the welfare, the, the sort of moral value of welfare of humans versus other species. Um, and this, this is their set of numbers. Um, and I have to say, you know, I worked on different things related to this project for two years, and I'm not sure after those two years, I feel any more confident about, about it because it's just such a wickedly hard question of how do you compare uh, across species. But um, there are groups that are really interested in this question of how, you, how do you make these uh, decisions and these trade-offs. And it's very relevant for your views on animal research because if one person thinks that you know, humans are completely inc incomparable, um, but someone else doesn't have that view, then you're gonna, you're gonna have different conclusions based on values, not necessarily based on what, what facts you believe. Um, relatedly, um, we can ask questions about aggregation. So aggregation meaning, you know, if you're counting up um, different things happening to different numbers of individuals and making predictions about the future. So, um, you know, of course, we're, if, we're, if we're being consequentialist about the future, we're always making decisions about what we expect to happen rather than what we know will happen because we never have complete certainty. Um, and so you can ask this question about how do you calculate um, the expected uh, benefits or expected harms of the future, um, how do you treat cases where there's a really low probability of something happening, but if it happens, it has really huge benefits? Um, and there's been a lot of discussion about that in ethics recently. Um, so you guys have probably heard about um, Sam Baker and Freed, obviously, but uh, he was also very associated with this notion of long-termism. Um, and long-termism is this view in ethics uh, that's you know, it's gonna sound pretty wild to, uh, to some of you, maybe including me. Uh, but the idea is basically that um, if you do an action now that uh, influences the far future, because there are gonna be so many more humans that live in the far future, um, the the expected utility of that action is really, really high, even if the probability of your action actually making a difference is very, very low. And you can sort of play around with the numbers to get, to get it to where it, it sounds plausible. But the basic idea is that we really should always just be focused on the far future um, because the chances of having really huge benefits um, are, are so great. So that's kind of a, you know, it's a, it's a strange view. Here's another strange view for your entertainment um, called uh, the repugnant conclusion, um, where if uh, within philosophy, there's a view called, or there's an argument called the repugnant conclusion about a world that no one would want to, to live in. Um, and this uh, philosopher of animal ethics uh, had a play on this called the repugnant conclusion, where he basically argued that um, even if there was this really small chance that nematodes were conscious, um, there are so many nematodes in the world that if you were, uh, you know, taking a pure utilitarian calculus, um, that uh, that you actually should be, you know, devoting all your efforts to protecting nematodes just because uh, there there's so many of them. So, anyways, the point is these are very strange views that can result from this question of. Um, what do you do in cases where there's really low probability of something being true, but huge uh, value, you know, huge potential uh, stakes at risk? Um, and I think there's plenty of, you know, these examples show, and also there's lots of examples just from how people make choices in their own life, that people don't really follow a strict uh, notion of goodness multiplied by probability formula for making choices about how we act. Um, and so there are tough questions about how do you aggregate? You know, is it really the case that um, doing uh, research on a certain number of individuals to, uh, to put that has a low chance of making a huge impact in the future? Um, how do we think about that? Um, and there's not, um, there's not a straightforward answer about how all people think about that. Uh, and again, it might, I think it comes down to value more than you know, not knowing how, uh, how multiplication works. Okay, so to, to kind of wrap up, so 
What I've hoped to have shown is that there are a lot of different value judgments that can get you different uh, evaluations of what you think about examples of animal research. And um, I think it's really important to question that and to be aware what other value systems other people might have. And so I want to present two different visions of you know, what, the, what the right way is to approach the world. So on one vision, you've got this supremely confident individual um, who you know, looks you straight in the eye and says, don't worry, we've got it all figured out. This is the right way to proceed. This is the correct way to think about this. Um, and you know, you don't need to you don't need to worry about it. The other vision uh, is someone who grapples with this really difficult question who says, oh yeah, I can understand why people have that intuition. I, I get why um, that value system is one that people might share. Um, I understand why people are really upset about um, what happened to this one individual, even if it resulted in uh, a lot of other really positive things happening down the road. Um, and I think in my mind, you know, there's no doubt that that first uh, approach is what's gonna, you know, the unwavering confidence approach is what's gonna be persuasive to people in the short term. If you're trying to just like convince people, you know, to pass a certain bill or to like win an election or uh, agree with your stance on a particular issue. But I also think that there's something missed um, if we abandon um, this approach to the world where we're questioning, where we're grappling, where we're acknowledging where questions are really difficult and we don't have a clear cut um, method that everyone agrees on for answering it. <clears throat> so uh, maybe another way of putting it is, you know, are we interested only in winning an argument or are we interested in seeking the truth? And I don't mean to put it that like bluntly as like that's, you know, there's only these two options and it's always the same answer because un unquestionably, there are many cases in the world where you do need to persuade other people. Um, and it is important to just, you know, win uh, an argument or sort of successfully persuade other people. So I'm not, I don't mean to put that as like the, the bad thing that's opposed to the truth. But I do think we also need to leave room for, um, you know, keeping questions open, not assuming that all of the answers uh, have already been provided. Um, and, you know, asking how, how closely these questions are aligned with each other. Okay, so my summary of what I am trying to convey is that I think we need to embrace the messiness of ethical questions. I think we need to embrace the uncertainty of ethical questions. I think we need to embrace the difficulty of ethical questions. They're not straightforward. They're challenging. That's why they're in the field of philosophy rather than other fields, because there's not a totally agreed upon method for answering them. And I think we need to embrace our roles as scholars um, and as the how and think about how a scholar um, approaches a question where there's no easy answers. And even if someone doesn't necessarily think of themselves as a scholar, um, I think you should you can adopt that mentality as something that's worth um, living out in the world. And we need to understand the fact that different views about values can underlie different disagreements. And so if someone's disagreeing with us, it doesn't mean that they're overly emotional. It doesn't mean that they're um, necessarily factually misinformed, they might just have a different set of values and, um, and that's worth um, respecting. And finally, uh, as respected leaders, as you know, everyone in this room is, um, and people at home watching on Zoom, um, we can demonstrate to the world how to approach challenging questions uh, and to demonstrate that they're worth taking seriously. So that's my presentation, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Schreiber. Again, if you have any questions online, please uh, post them in the Q and A. Um, so, Adam, I have a question. Then, so, um, uh, so, what have scientists 
been neglecting in their in anal- or assessing their own values. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, and then how can they uh, best communicate those to the general public? I guess I don't necessarily think there's reason to think that scientists haven't been um, examining their own values, but my point is really just um, that it's important when we're engaging with other people who might have different views on research that um, their views might just be informed by by a different set of values. It doesn't have to mean that they're factually uh, uninformed. Um, It might be that they just have a tremendous amount of empathy for the life of an individual, um, and I think there's something you know kind of beautiful about it. Even if you know in the messy real world, you can't always uh, follow that. So, yeah. So I guess I, I'm not. I don't mean to imply that um, scientists have not thought about their own value systems as much as just it's important to be aware of how many different possible systems there are out there and uh, and to take them all seriously. Other questions? Alice? Thank you very much, Adam. That was wonderful. Um, My question is, I understand what you're saying about the confidence versus the questioning approaches. What happens if you believe in the questioning approach and you want to follow that and you need to communicate with someone with the confidence approach? Okay, so, so one individual has the questioning approach and they, they, they're interacting with someone with the confidence approach and they're wondering how to, how to handle that situation. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's a, it's a pretty difficult challenge that you could imagine or I'm, that I'm sure it does arise in many, many cases in the real world. Um, and I don't think there's any algorithm that we can follow that's just going to say in this situation you should shift to acting confident yourself um, versus in that situation you should you know you should adopt the questioning view Um, but I do just think that you know you have to leave space for that that questioning approach and I don't know I'm not I'm not answering your question very very well but I just it's almost like you have to kind of feel out um, when when you think it's appropriate and when not so Sorry to not have a better answer. <laughs> Margaret? Adam, thank you. I thought that was a great talk. And I love the Dostoevsky quote, which I was unfamiliar with, but helped me, helped me imagine a number of things. And the non-consequentialism of clinical trials, that's relatively recent, wouldn't you say? I mean, if you go back in time there was very consequentialist approach to even the use of humans in experimental studies. And so the definition of the non-consequentialism is, I don't know, 50, 60 years ago or so. Um, And I just mentioned that because we still struggle in the animal space. So it's not that, that it's always been the same in the human space. I just wanted to point out. Yeah, that's a really interesting observation. So I think the term non-consequentialist is fairly recent. I mean, I think if you look at how people made decisions, they probably made decisions in ways that we would call non-consequentialist now in certain cases, but you're right. And when it comes to human research and the rules that govern it, a lot of the rules that are, that kind of jump out as being really (laughs) non-consequentialist are rules that have arisen in the last hundred years or, you know, as part of the, the different responses to, um, you know, scandals like Nazi experimentation and um, Tuskegee yeah. and those types of things. So, so definitely, um, yeah, that it's not, it's not a static um, set of rules. It, it has evolved in the human case and mm-hmm. it's possible that it could evolve in the case of animals. So, so one example of something that would technically be uh, non-consequentialist is if you, if you had an upper threshold of, distress that an animal could have um, in a, in an experiment. Uh, so there's some countries that have rules right, like that, right? So that's something where it's saying it doesn't matter what consequences result from it. You can't go above this threshold would be an example of that. Um, so. I had another one, but maybe we, you're going to be on the panel, right? And it dealt with 
Peter Singer and speciesism. So if you want to think about that, I'll get to it later. Joe, we have time for one more. Uh, thanks, Adam. Great presentation. Um, was wondering from a philosophical standpoint, when you're talking and going into the arena of discussing ethical animal use for research, um, I find that it's very difficult unless you build a societal uh, impact of how society can have differing ethical values about the use of animals across the spectrum and then build to the focal uh, ethical uh, discussion about biomedical ethics and comparing that. Is, is that a, a philosophical technique or is that a, a way to, uh, to uh, approach that, uh, that, that subject? Uh, that's an interesting idea. So can you say more about how that would go in a sure, talk? Sure, so, sure. Yeah. So, um, I typically will like throw a slide up that shows, in, and then I'll give a personal approach to, um, I used to hunt for sport and then I had an experience that now I only will hunt unless I'm putting food on my table. Mm. Um, and I don't hunt for sport anymore, but I still fish. Mm. Um, or um, I, uh, I did research using animals. I had a bad experience and now I have changed my ethical stance mm. about it. Or I use food and fiber Mm -hmm. uh, for my clothing. And, uh, so all the different approaches our society has towards the use of animals versus the smaller subset, which is the use for biomedical research or other animal uses in, in wildlife and other stuff. So, yeah. and, and then go into the discussion about what are the ethical consequences of making decisions uh, about the, and we struggle with this all the time, then the risk benefit analysis of the use of that animal or the pain and distress that an animal may suffer or experience. Yeah, um, that's great. I mean, I guess, so um, Rawls, who I referenced earlier, had this idea of what he calls uh, reflective equilibrium, where he thought you have this kind of moral theory, but then you test it out by looking at individual cases. So it might be, uh, you know, hunting for sport might be an example of something where if you have a strong intuition about that, that might inform what your theory is. Um, but then you look at a different type of case, like being vegetarian, and maybe your intuition is different in that case. And so, so he saw it as this kind of interplay between specific instances and this overarching theory value set that guides behavior. Um, now, if I'm being honest, uh, unfortunately for philosophers, probably a lot of people don't necessarily have some like pure, like, and probably not even most philosophers have this like pure set of rules that they like consistently follow that actually describes how they make choices in every possible situation. Um, so, so the real world's more messy than, um, than the idea that you can fit everything under one theory that perfectly describes everything. Um, but but I do think that's a it's a it's a valuable way of helping people understand what their values are if you present them with specific cases where they where you draw out their intuitions and then um, and draw implications from what their intuitions are about specific cases. So. Excellent. We're going to uh, stop the questions here. There are a couple in the comments. I'm going to hold these for the final session. Uh, they're really good. So, uh, but uh, we're going to take a break. Um, Nia to 2.45 or to 15 minutes. We're gonna take 15 minutes, see you at 2.50. And then, and then this is um, a screenshot from a video of a student who is talking about his research. Um, so again, different ways that people can share things that you can support your colleagues by sharing the content that they post. Okay, so a few tips for effective engagement. First, know your audience for each platform. We uh, talked a little bit about this. You've got Twitter that has, or X, that has a very academic presence. There's a lot of conversation that goes on with scientists on X. Um, and then you've got you know, Facebook, where you're probably not going to reach the younger generations with what you post. Um, so a, an effective or a more effective method might be to be on multiple platforms to try to reach different audiences. Understand the platform limitations. We've talked about some of them, like X with their caption or their um, their character limits, or Instagram with the captions not having clickable links. Um, 
make it easy for your followers. So uh, regarding the clickable links, one thing that we do and what a lot of different pages do is that in their bio, there is a single link at the top of a bio on Instagram. And that link will take you to a page that has links to all of the articles that you post. So it makes it so if I post about, you know, this bearded dragon, someone can just go to the top of the Instagram page, click that link, and they'll be able to find the article. So it's not buried in a caption and it's not difficult for them to find. That's how we get people to read things, right? We need to keep the number of clicks that they have to do to a minimum. Try to make sure your content is really positive. Uh, there's so much negativity out there these days and people really are attracted to the positive messages, the pictures, the animals. So really try to focus on that. And be sure that you are assessing your reach and your impact. Don't, you know, if, if all you can do is post and not worry about anything else, that's fine. It's better than nothing. But if you can take a few moments to say, which of these posts were most effective? Um, who liked this one? Who didn't, you know, where in the demographically, who did I reach with this? Um, it's worth just a few minutes of your time. A few of the lessons that I have learned through running these different social media platforms. Um, read before you share. So sometimes titles can be deceiving and even the beginning of articles can be very deceiving. So be sure that what you're sharing has the message that you want to get across because if you don't have the time to read it and somebody else does and they then associate that with your account, it can do a lot of damage. So be sure you're actually looking at what it says and know that the positive that comes from sharing on social media far outweighs the negative. From years of experience of doing this, I can tell you that I have had far more positive interactions and experiences on this than negative. Images matter, similar to the content, the titles, make sure that the images in the article are supporting the message that you're trying to get across. Um, if you, even if the, the article itself has really great content, if there's a picture and all they do is click on that link and see that picture and that maybe doesn't give the best picture, that's what they're going to remember. So it may mean that some articles that are really good don't get shared because you know that that's just not, ultimately there's a risk that it's not gonna put across the message that you want. And we have talked about this multiple times, attention spans are short. Um, if you're making videos, make them short. If you're using captions, keep them brief. Don't use a lot of words. Um, people are quick to scroll by things. So um, it's, there are lots of ways for you to make an impact on social media. It really shouldn't be a scary thing. I know for some who maybe are not comfortable with it yet, it can be, but um, we are here to help you. Uh, I hope you all will consider following Brad on social media and potentially beginning by sharing some of the content that we share. This QR code will bring you to a page on our website that has all of these linked. So it will make it very easy for you to find our social media platforms. And as a little challenge for everyone who is uh, watching this workshop today, participating, I challenge all of you by the end of the week to do one of these two things. So for those of you who don't have a social media platform yet, please create one, pick a platform, create an account um, and just start playing around, getting comfortable. And if you do already have an account on one of these platforms, by the end of the week, I challenge you to post one thing about animals and research. It can be shared from someone else. It can be one that you create using your new account on Canva. Um, so please, please, this is a really easy, quick step. It's something that is actionable that we would love to see you doing. That is what every one per person does. We can make a really big impact. So if we have everyone, I don't know how many are on right now, but if we have every single person do this, think of the reach that we will get just by the end of the week. So with that, I really appreciate your attention. Uh, I hope that this was informative and helpful and thank you again for the opportunity to speak today. And please feel free to reach out if you have any questions. Thank you, Logan. That was a fantastic presentation and so much to learn from that. Um, just for the record, you had 165 people listening to you directly. Um, very quickly, we'll just do one question for the sake of time. And I'm going to combine because these questions all have the same theme. Um, so someone says, I get the value of sharing research, um, animal research themed content on social media. But what's your advice for an institution that is already in the crosshairs of anti-animal research activists, especially given that social media tend to attract the most vitriolic of comments. Um, there is another question that has a similar theme, speaking to why poke the bear. Um, how do you handle negative comments which are inevitable on social media? 
Yes, so is this, everybody can hear me. Um, in terms of an, an organization or an institution that may already be in trouble, um, I don't think, I, I think the theme here is that being quiet is not the answer, that telling, sharing the facts, sharing the good, staying positive, talking about what you are doing with animals that is a good thing. So don't, don't talk about the issue that is potentially at the forefront of all of the other media articles, but share and highlight the good things that are happening. Um, in terms of negative comments, Yes, they, they have happened. They do happen sometimes. And there are different ways to address them. And I actually work with the AMP team quite a bit when this does happen to just say, okay, what would you do in this situation? Um, we find that sometimes engaging online is not always productive. So there are different ways. If you think it may be, you certainly can attempt to. I know that I have had personal message back and forth with people who have commented. If I have, I have had a friend who um, posted something on their own page about uh, a dog project and I messaged her and said, hey, I just want you to know, like, let's talk about this and gave her some of the information. We had a dialogue back and forth. And then she actually changed what she deleted her previous post and changed what she had posted. So those types of interactions can be really positive if you feel, if you have the energy to do it, um, if you have the facts to do it, if you feel like it's going to be productive. Um, if it's not, and if you have someone who's really inflammatory, there are a few options. You can hide their post on your pages so that they don't know that you've hidden it. They can still see it. They think it's there, but no one else can see it. Um, or you could respond to them if you feel, again, if you feel that that's lucrative or you could, if you wanted, you could delete their post or uh, block them from your page. We really don't do that much. We want the whole purpose of being on social media is to share information. And if we're blocking out those people who are making those comments, then they're not getting the information that we're trying to get across. So um, I think there are, there are different ways to handle it and it is very situational dependent. Thank you for that. I think that's a tough one for many, many scientists. And what I'm hearing is scientists should not silence themselves because of concern that there might be negative comments. Agreed. Oh, great. <laughs> well, I know we have a fantastic panel lined up and I'm sure there are going to be many more questions for you. So I'm going to kick things back to those in the room so that they can get the panel discussion started.